Cora and Bernhardt. This appears to be a 25 caliber bullet. Somebody was in there looking for something. Who would want them dead? That's the million dollar question. This case is keeping me up at night because there are holes I can't fill. There's all kinds of stories about who did it. There was an outcry. I mean, people are scared. You know, you've got these beautiful rolling hills with all the crop just newly planted here. We just pulled into Portage County, Ohio, which is a very rural part of the state. A lot of corn and peas and cows. It is the heartland of America. Atwater Township, founded as a township, 1810. My family has been a part of Atwater for uh, about 100 plus years. The church behind me, my great-grandfather built that chimney way back in 1933. It's basically small town USA. People out here love each other. Yeah, and you can see it. If people need help, there's always somebody there. My neighbor will call me up if my car is out in the driveway too long and not put away. She'll say, are you okay? This is the rural farm road here in Atwater where in April of 1990, an elderly couple was murdered brutally in their kitchen. And so this very small community was rightfully horrified. One day I received notification that a man had not seen his neighbor for a couple days. He went over and kind of checked the house out Everything was uh, secure, but he looked in and he saw two bodies laying in the house. He called the Portage County Sheriff's Department. My detective bureau and deputies responded. It is approximately 8.33 p.m. I met the residents of Cora and Bernhardt, H-A-R-T-I-G. From the observation of the arrangement of the chairs, it appeared that Mr. and Mrs. Hardy were both shot sitting at the kitchen table. Mrs. Hardy had been shot five times, and Mr. Hardy had been shot three times. This appears to be a projectile, possibly the 25 caliber bullet there were 25 caliber casings. That would be a total of seven shell casings at this point, plus one projectile. The detectives started searching the rest of the house. There was no sign of forced entry, and it didn't appear there was any struggle of any kind. It appeared to me that it had to be somebody who was welcomed into their home. Come to the bathroom. The one cabinet door is ajar. The detectives went through, and you could see the drawers pulled out and just papers thrown around. Papers on the floor in disarray. The end table, two drawers open. The house had been ransacked. Somebody was in there looking for something. I asked the detectives, do you know if anything was taken? And they said, no watches and things were still in the drawers. There wasn't anything of any value taken. When the murders happened, it was the talk of the town. Everybody was concerned about it. Nobody knew why it happened. This was big, big news in Portage County because it was so odd. I'm Andrea Simakas. In the 1990s, I was working at the Cleveland Plain Dealer doing investigative reporting. According to friends and neighbors, the Hardigs were quiet and well thought of in the community. Mr. Hardig was a butcher. He was retired at the time of the murders, and Cora was a homemaker. It's not usual to have a, a well-known, well-liked elderly couple gunned down in their own homes. It, it frightened people. 
There's all kinds of stories about what happened and who did it. It causes fear and people lock their doors. It's terrible to have to feel that way in a town like this. In April of 1990, when they found this 81-year-old couple murdered in their kitchen, it was shocking. The pressure on elected officials to get to an answer quickly was immense. People want to be able to sleep at night. We are meeting with Vicki Buckwalter, who has worked as an investigator here in Portage County. She got involved in this case very early on. Vicki? Yes. I'm Hillary. Hi. It is so nice to meet you. You too. Thank you so much for meeting today. Oh, you're welcome. This is a heinous murder of an elderly couple. What did you know when you first saw this case? There was no forced entry and there were no fingerprints. Was there a murder weapon found on scene? There was no murder weapon, um, but they did determine that the Hartids were both shot with a 25 automatic pistol. So where did the police start looking? They started doing um, searches of crimes in the area. Okay. And there was some home invasion robberies in Alliance, Ohio, which was 10 miles maybe from Atwater. And they were done by just kids. And they immediately got on the radar of the sheriff's department. They were doing what they referred to as car shopping, where they would go around and see if car doors would open and then they'd take change out of there or take credit cards and buy pizza and, you know, drugs and alcohol, things like that. Tell me a little bit about these kids. Just teenagers ranging from 14 to 21. They were a group of young guys. They were crashing in the home of one of their friends. They had no supervision. They could do what they wanted. And they were like lost boys. Tyrone Nulling was the leader of this gang of lost boys. He was 18 at the time. He had a long juvenile record. Following him was Joey D'Alessandro. Joey was also 18, and they were tight. Gary St. Clair was 21, a high school dropout. And then uh, rounding out this group, a 14-year-old Butch Walcott. On April 4th, 1990, their petty crimes escalated to a true home invasion. They knocked on a door nearby the place where they were crashing. There was an elderly couple, and the ruse was they said their car broke down and they needed help. They were invited in. Tyrone went in with a shotgun. While inside, they stole cash, jewelry, and a 25 caliber pistol. The very next day, Tyrone did the same thing at another neighbor's home, another elderly couple, and this time Tyrone was armed with the 25 caliber pistol he had taken in the previous robbery. Anything that wasn't nailed down was taken. Cash, jewelry taken off hands, watches taken off wrists. Tyrone is in the bedroom and he's got the gun in his hand and he's loading up things in this pillowcase and it caused his trigger finger to shoot the gun. And he was freaked out. He was described by the woman as a scared rabbit. He asked her, are you okay, are you okay? And got out of there. Witnesses saw them running from the home in broad daylight, carrying a VCR with a cord trailing behind them. It is a serious crime to walk into anybody's house and pull a gun on them. These boys were suspect right from the go of the Hardy murder. You have home invasions, older couples, home at the time, and chiefly a 25 caliber is used in the last robbery in Alliance and to murder the Hardicks. For the police, the similarities were too hard to ignore. very close in time to when the Hardig's bodies were discovered. In the nearby town of Alliance, there were similar home invasions of elderly couples, which made those robberies very interesting to police. You're walking a very fine line there of 
of juvenile hijinks like breaking into cars and stuff and now you're venturing into very adult, very criminal behavior. It was known that Tyrone had a 25 caliber weapon and right away everybody thought this could be the weapon that was used in the Harley case and the detective bureau went to interview these kids about the Hardy murder. Tyrone readily admitted his culpability in the Alliance robberies, but he says he has nothing to do with the murders, as do his friends. And so while they're locked up, does the investigation into the Hartig murders continue? Yeah, yeah. It does continue. The county sheriff is investigating the surface similarities of the crimes, home invasions, elderly couple. But after those surface similarities, the cases diverge. Nothing is taken out of the heart of the home. Money is left in Bernhardt's pocket. Cora's wedding ring is on her finger. Why leave everything behind when your previous MO had you taking everything in sight? The murder weapon was a 25, which really got these guys on the radar. Yeah. And so they did ballistics testing, and the gun that Tyrone shot at the second robbery came back to not be the murder weapon. It's not the same gun. Not the same gun. Police also recovered a cigarette butt on the Hardig's driveway. They thought could have been dropped by the killer because neither of the Hardig's smoked, and Bernhard kept a very clean driveway. There was DNA tests performed on the cigarette, but the four boys, it was none of their DNA. I feel like the sheriff's department was probably like, yes, we figured it out. And then for the gun not to match and for the cigarette butt not to match any of the four guys, how do you tie them in then? You don't. Okay. <laughs> and they didn't. I don't believe there was anything found in possession of these boys that would put them at the house. There was nothing that could hold them as suspects for this crime. What can you tell me about the Hardigs? Who would want them dead? Well, that's the million dollar question. Mr. Hardig had clearly saved throughout his life and he was known to be a person you could go to for personal loans. In their investigation, they found out that there was a doctor that was, was friends with Mr. Hartig, and the doctor said that he had talked to Mr. Hartig the day before they were killed. Okay. And he said that Mr. Hartig had loaned his insurance man, Louis Lehman, $10,000, and it had come due. He was going to meet with the insurance man to get his money, and Mr. Hartig said, I haven't heard a hide nor hair from him. Something doesn't smell right, and I'll be calling him as soon as we hang up the phone here. Mr. Hartig was going to have words with his insurance guy. That was the last thing the doctor ever heard from them? Yes. Investigators naturally wanted to speak to this insurance agent, Louis Lehman. If he was indeed the last call Bernhard Hartig might have made in anger, and significantly, they also found out that this insurance agent had a 25 caliber pistol registered to him. They brought him in. They questioned him. When they asked him to produce the weapon, he said he'd sold it. He couldn't remember to whom, and he couldn't remember when. Then investigators rightfully questioned Lewis Lehman about the loan. Lewis had said that, yes, he did know the Hartigs, but that he didn't owe them any money. He said he didn't owe them any money? He said he didn't owe them any money. The doctor said he had a very detailed repayment schedule, but when police searched the house, they could not find any such record for this insurance agent. And so they let him walk out at the door. We didn't have enough evidence to pursue anybody, really. I would say it became a cold case. The uh, sheriff's department was kind of at a loss. There was an outcry. I mean, people are scared. Hi, is this David Norris? Yes, it is. Hi, sir, this is Andrea Samakis calling from the Plain Dealer. Portage County Prosecutor David Norris 
was under enormous pressure to solve this murder in this sleepy town that never should have happened. It's like after about a year later, you know, nothing had happened, and it kind of embarrassed everybody. Right. We've got a duty to investigate this further. Okay. Here's the thing. I know that Ron Craig uh, was brought into this investigation. David Norris brought in his bulldog, his enforcer, an investigator named Ron Craig, to take a look at this cold case and see what he could do. Ron Craig is a guy who has a reputation of getting confessions from people. He is the prosecutor's investigator. Correct. Why was he considered successful? He got convictions. What do they do? Two years after the murders, they decided to refocus on Tyrone Nolling and friends. Tyrone? is doing time for the Alliance robberies. So is Gary St. Clair. Joey was in and out of jail for unrelated drug crimes. And Butch is out. Butch is free. So Ron Craig goes right to Butch Walcott, who's still a teenager. He's 16 at this time. Ron Craig was uh, intense, to say the very least. Ron Craig and the prosecutor, they interrogated me for a long time. They started to grind on me you know, because I wasn't admitting it. The thing that scared me the most was they said that they had some utility worker up on a pole that seen us there. And that, to me, was scary because that's an eyewitness. They also tell him that there was a match on the cigarette butt to him. And I'm sure Butch is thinking, if they say that there's evidence putting me there, then I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. They said, we'll prosecute you. Even though you're a juvenile, you might not get death row, but you'll get the rest of your life. And they start saying, hey, if you say that Tyrone was involved in these murders, then we'll wipe your record. We'll give you immunity on the murders. When they say, well, we'll give you immunity, that was my life's breath. That was the the thing that was going to save me. I said I, I was there. So Butch said they drove from Alliance to Atwater in Joey D'Alessandro's car. They saw the Hardick's house. Butch and Joey stay in the car, and Tyrone and Gary go inside. While inside, that is when Tyrone executes the Hardick's. Who do they go to next? They go to Joey next. And they have Butch saying he was the driver, and Joey does take a deal. So the dominoes are starting to fall, and then there's Gary. Well, he's already in for 5 to 25 on this first conviction. What is the investigator and the prosecutor um, threatening him with? Oh, they're threatening him with death. Mm -hmm. We know you were in the house. Butch puts you in the house, Joey puts you in the house, we know you're in the house. Ron Craig has done his job. Now three guys, Butch, Joey, and Gary, are pointing the finger at the trigger man, Tyrone Nolan. Two deputy sheriffs from Portage County, they told me, you're going to court, pack your stuff. They drove me back down to Portage County and a detective came up and said I was charged with two aggravated murders in the first degree. They said nothing, didn't ask nothing. They claimed they already had all their evidence. And I was just like, is this a joke? They offered a deal, and it was 30 to life. The judge spoke to me and said I was young. He didn't want to sentence me to death. I should take this deal. My lawyer said hey, you should think about it, and the prosecutor said, we'll give you 24 hours. I called my dad, and he was like, well, you're not taking it, right? I said, absolutely not. No, because I didn't do this. He refuses the deal to save his life. He refuses the deal that would keep him off death row. 
he knows three people are going to take that stand and say he killed the Hardigs. And yet, he does not cave under the pressure. That blows me away. So how do you get involved in this case? At that time, I was working for a private investigation firm. I was hired by Tyrone Nolings defense attorneys to investigate the murder to prepare them for court. Okay. What's the evidence that the state puts forward to try and convict Tyrone? They didn't have a murder weapon. They didn't have any DNA evidence. Um, they had the boys who were testifying. Butch testified that he saw smoke coming out of the Tyrone's gun as he was fleeing the Hardig's home. Then Joey takes the stand and says that Tyrone calls him from jail and he tells him, Joey, you've got to get rid of the murder weapon. It's in the glove compartment of your car. Joey testifies that he sells it to a fence and that's how the murder weapon disappears. At the trial, everything lines up just like Tyrone was told it would. Except for one thing. When it's Gary St. Clair's turn to take the stand, he drops this bombshell. Gary gets up there and says, we weren't there. Tyrone wasn't there. He didn't do it. I didn't do it. None of us did it. Did the state freak out? Yeah, they treated him as a hostile witness. What does that mean? What do they do? They get up there with his prior statements and they try to impeach him. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say that? And didn't you say this? And so Gary was forced to say yes, yes, yes. You would think that would create reasonable doubt in the jury's mind, but somehow it did not. One of the jurors came in and she looked at me and she put her head down and started crying. That told me it wasn't gonna be good. And uh, my heart just sank. They immediately rushed me out of the courtroom, took me to death row in a matter of 72 hours. I was shocked. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, it, this, this can't be happening. It's a walking nightmare. So for a young man who declares his innocence this whole time, is sentenced to death, what do you do? He got a post-conviction attorney, mm -hmm. and that's where I came in. You came back in? I came back in. So what did you do? I wanted to find Butch so bad. One day, this pretty little lady was knocking on my door, and um, she asked me if, if she could talk to me, and I'm like, yeah, sure. I said, I'm here about the Tyrone Nolan case. He thought I was from the prosecutor's office. I was in a ton of fear at this point in my life. I thought, they're going to wrap it up somehow and get me in prison too. When I told Butch that I just wanted to hear his story, his legs went weak because he was so relieved. She said, you know, you, you can change everything and say what, you, what the truth is. I was, yes, let's do that. Butch said, I will do whatever it takes to make this right. The testimony that I gave put this man on death row. I can't live with myself for what I did. Ronald Craig, the devil incarnate. That's not a joke. We don't say what he wants you to say. There's tons of pressure, tons of uh, intimidation. They wouldn't let my dad into the interrogation room. I probably got a good 40, 50 hours of interrogation, which is very terrifying to go through, especially when people have your freedom in their hands. Ron Craig realized he had a problem, and that was Butch didn't know anything about the crime. He didn't know anything about the crime scene. He couldn't even describe the Hardig's house. Nothing. So... To solve this problem, the Portage County investigative team brings in a psychologist to unearth buried memories. 
they told me he was going to get the memories to come out. Now, I had no reason to believe that they were lying. Okay, I did forget it. So, yeah, let me go see this doctor and, and let's get these memories out. So, I'm not holding on to this. Butch said that they fed him information. So, after he tells them that he can't describe the house, they drive him to the house. So, there's myself, the doctor, and Ron Craig all driving down this road. Everything was normal, conversation was normal. And then as we were coming up on the house, everything got quiet. The car slowed down, slowed down enough for him to look at the house and then look through the rearview mirror directly into my eyes and then back at the house. And that was my signal. That's the house. That's the one. That's it. Nobody sees what Ron Craig's doing. He's not making any noises. Everything is subliminal. This is what I should be describing to them because this is what they obviously want to hear. The doctor told the prosecution team, Ron Craig et al., that he was concerned that the more they pressed Butch, the more frightened he was that what they were doing was pushing him to make a false statement. He warned them that it might be going too far. Prosecutors ignored that and continued to condition and rehearse Butch. I was telling lies, 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 lies. To do what? Save myself. And they put me in a predicament where it was okay to lie. It was like being molested, but in your brain. He was manipulated. If you think about how old he was, it was child abuse. Here's what didn't happen. None of it. The whole thing is made up. We were never there. The car never went there. Those tires were never on that road. It didn't happen. Joey says that Ron Craig et al. were yelling at him, telling him he's got to come through for them. They all had the same story. They have a choice. Lie, confess, or die. You have kids without advocates. You have a crime that everyone's desperate to solve. It's a perfect storm to create a false confession. We have three affidavits. The only people who could put Tyrone in that house, they've all recanted. I'm over the moon excited about it. And so what does that mean? If that's what the state's case was based on and they all take it back. Portage County actually gave us an evidentiary hearing. But the bad thing is you have a county who prosecutes these guys. Mm -hmm. And then you have judges in the same county mm -hmm. that you have to deal with. So when we got to the hearing... The judge wouldn't let the boys testify. And the attorney is like, you have to hear these boys, they're credible. And the judge was, nope. So basically it was dead in the water. Nothing. <sighs> Did the court not care about new information? It's almost impossible to get a conviction overturned. The anchor of the case against Tyrone are these three eyewitness testimonies. But all three of them have been recanted. Why do you feel like there's so much pushback? If you have a wrongful conviction, not only are they going to owe Tyrone Noling a lot of monetary value, but they're also going to have to maybe go back into all of their cases that investigator was involved in and take a second look. So they'd rather kill a potentially innocent person than go back and check their work. That's my view. I mean, reputation trumps life. This is the neighborhood where Tyrone and Gary and Joey and Butch were all living together. The boys' goal was to rob people. So they had money. They could buy beer. They could buy weed. Their whole M.O. was to stay local and find places that they could access on foot that these boys would make the commute from here almost 10 miles out 
to a place where you have no connection and then murder an elderly couple and not take anything. I don't know how you make that motive make sense to a jury. Hey, hey. Hey, how Hi. are you? How great to meet you. Yeah, I'm so happy to meet you. I have such respect for the work that you do. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Tell me about this case. As an investigative journalist, I had done some work on wrongful convictions in the past. You have to be really careful about what cases you go after. Well, because do you feel like your reputation is on the line when you dig into something? A hundred percent. But... This case started bothering me out the gate. I mean, if you're 14, 16, 18, 20, right? And you're hearing, you can either tell us Tyrone did it or you are going to die. That's a death threat. It's a, they're being threatened with death, the ultimate penalty. I started looking into the case and I'm like, oh my God, wait, so no hair, no physical evidence whatsoever, no blood, no saliva, no weapon, nothing, 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 right? You can send somebody on death row with nothing? And yeah, the answer is yes, you can. So I tried to find every living human being who would talk to me that touched the case, and one of those people was an Alliance cop who impounded Joey's car because at trial, Joey got on the stand and explained the reason the murder weapon wasn't in Tyrone's possession. Joey said they left the murder weapon in the glove compartment of the car, and after they were all arrested, Tyrone told him to get rid of it. But Joey couldn't have gotten rid of the gun because no gun existed, because police had already searched the car. They searched the car for the, the weapon. It was in the driveway and all the doors were open. Okay. We were really trying to tie in that um, finding a 25 automatic there. And you didn't find anything? I don't remember anything of value or importance coming out of the car. He didn't find the murder weapon because it wasn't there. And when I asked the prosecutor, Bellucci, about this, yeah, he said uh, the cop was clearly mistaken. I'm not sure that the Alliance police didn't make a mistake in there. Okay. In this situation, the prosecutor is undermining the Alliance police department. Yeah, and that car was impounded and it was searched, and there was no 25 in the glove compartment. And you're telling us we should disregard that? That's ridiculous. In the prosecutor's files, I found evidence that wasn't presented to the jury that is about alternative suspects. The insurance agent interested me, not only because he had confirmed to have had the same caliber weapon as was used in the murders, but that he had a relationship with the Hardigs. He had been in the Hardig home. And if we go back to the crime scene, there were papers everywhere, as if someone was looking for something. They certainly weren't looking for money. And they left jewelry, and they left $160 in cash. Could there have been a record of a loan that had gone bad? And could that be the reason that the Hardigs were killed? I don't know, but it's a legitimate thing to ask. The jurors never heard about it. Andrea laid it out like a road map. Everything that was done in this case and about the coercion. She wrote a beautiful article about what can happen in a little small town like this. When your article comes out, is the newspaper confident or are they nervous about attacking elected officials? They would not have published it had they not felt it could stand up mm -hmm. to scrutiny. And I was really hopeful that it would blow it wide open, it would make a difference. And certainly Tyrone's attorneys were excited by it because they said there were other things I found in the court record that they didn't know about. So we decided to publish all of it. We put it online so anybody could have access to it. Is anything found post-conviction that should have been flagged? Tyrone's attorneys were able to pluck documents that they say were not heard at trial. Police, during the initial investigation, talked to a lot of people, and one of the people told them about a young man who told someone at his school that his foster brother had killed the hard eggs. But the police just dropped it, and Tyrone's attorneys found this document 
And then they found this young man, Nathan Chesley, who's now an adult. What he had to say, it's shocking. My name is Nathan Chesley, and in 1990, I was 17. I was a ward of the state, and they sent me to a foster home in Atwater, Ohio. Dan Wilson also stayed there. Dan Wilson had various crimes as a child, but the biggest one was murder. Dan was robbing an elderly man, threw him down the stairs, killed him. Everybody knew Dan was a murderer. When I was in foster care, where we were staying in Atwater was within about a mile of the Hardick's house. Dan knew the Hardick's, he mowed their grass. One night after the murders of the Hardick's, Dan came in, I could tell he was drunk. He had that look on his face and he was talking in a different tone. And he explained that he had killed the Hardigs. And he was just kind of like confessing on himself. He never went into why they were killed. But I was 100% for sure he did it because he had a 25 uh, auto handgun. Dan was a very violent person. Anything was possible. I was just waiting for a, a knock on the door from law enforcement, but yeah, they never did. After that, Dan left right away. The next time I heard about him on the news, they're talking about Dan Wilson, Ohio, is going to be executed. Dan Wilson kidnapped a young woman, put her body in the trunk, and set the car on fire. I thought he looked better as a suspect from a psychological standpoint than Scared Rabbit Noling and his gang. I wanted to talk to Norris and ask him why he discounted this suspect. This case is keeping me up at night because there are holes I can't fill. I wanted to know if you could remember why Wilson was thrown out as a suspect. And I just don't remember. Right. I don't remember. He never gave me a satisfactory answer. We're looking for cases where there is new evidence that can be raised to the court. There were documents in the files of Tyrone's co-defendants that do not appear to be in Tyrone's file. What these notes show is that even prior to Tyrone's trial, police had thought enough of Dan Wilson as a suspect to compare his blood type to the blood type from saliva from the cigarette butt found in the Hardings driveway and found that it was consistent. So the DNA tests had definitively excluded Tyrone and his co-defendants, but Dan Wilson could not be excluded. You have a very credible lead against a, a person who had committed other violent crimes, who lived right next door to the Hardigs, and the jury never got to hear any of that. Justice is not just having a guy in jail, it's having the right person in jail. The Innocence Project wanted me to get my story to the court. So I went to Portage County and sat there and sat there. <laughs> Literally, I sat there probably four or five hours on a bench waiting to get called in to tell the judge what I had to say about Dan. They just let me go and wouldn't hear anything. They didn't care that it could be Dan. There are lots of things at the scene that were likely last touched by the person who committed the crime. 10 casings from the 25 caliber pistol. Ring boxes that were opened and rummaged through. Touch DNA is something we could never have done in 1990, but now we have state-of-the-art testing that can pick up just if you've touched something, right? This perhaps would be finally the exoneration Tyrone has sought. Yeah. It could also lead us to the real killer. This case stinks. We all know it. And yet one prosecutor with Ohio judges' help is looking the other way. 
as far as where I stand today in my appeals, I have very little left and I am up against time. At this point, there is no death day, but this is probably my last hope. You have no idea how deep inside of me I want to say I'm sorry. And the saddest part is if I wasn't a kid and so scared, then I would have told the truth from the beginning and none of this would have happened. When you start to understand the facts that my three friends, they were manipulated and pressured and lied to by Ron Craig, it's easy to forgive because I'm not the only victim here. Everybody in this case is a victim. I sit on death row without a shred of evidence. It can happen to you, it can happen to anybody because it's happening to me. People love true crime. They love solving the puzzle, but then it's really easy to turn the channel or turn the television off and forget that there is a potentially innocent person who is going to die. He's going to die if something isn't done. I'm sorry. It's overwhelming. It just hits you sometimes. Why are you appearing anonymously? Heather's case has never been solved, and it should have been solved a long time ago. Being small town, I am in somewhat fear of what could possibly happen to me about saying my opinions and what I've physically seen at the funeral home. Dallas, Georgia is a small community 45 minutes west of Atlanta. It's a rural community. It's about as close to country as you're going to get from Atlanta. We got a little bit of land and we ride, hunt, fish. Nobody really gives any problems. There are many families that have been here for 200 plus years. Most people around here are fairly conservative, but not close-minded. Hey, that's a Methodist church. That's where I was confirmed. There's a church every two feet in this part of the country. Most everybody mentions their religion and talk about God. I do feel very safe here, but things do happen in small towns that, um, that maybe you wouldn't think would. After our first season aired, I got a Facebook message from someone who felt they had a case that we really needed to be looking into. In 2017, a young mother Heather Turner, 35 years old, super active in the church. She's found dead. It's reported that it's a suicide. And yet, five years later, her death is still an open case in this town, still under investigation. And the cause of her death is still undetermined. And there are a number of people in this town that really feel like there's so much more to this story. The circumstances, situations surrounding it. Knowing all the players, you know, I have questions of my own that haven't been answered. That need to be answered. Things have happened in this community that are terrible, that people should maybe um, investigate more. But that's all I'm going to say about that. Calling County 911, what are you calling to report? Glasses shot herself after Your wife, where did she shoot herself? In the head. Oh, oh my God. Take a deep breath. What's your name? My name is Andy Turner. What's your wife's name? Heather. May 2017, the corner of Fulton County, Lindsay Eberhardt called my secretary, said, I want y'all to know that uh, Heather's body is ready to be released. And my secretary said, what do you mean? She said, well, Heather Turner has committed suicide. I knew Heather, one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen inside and out. And I immediately said, there ain't no way. We sent our guys out to bring Heather to the funeral home. 
you know, when we unzipped the bag, I knew this beautiful woman. Now, her face was pretty much gone. And it made me sick. I wanted to throw up. And in my career, that was probably the worst gunshot to the head that I've ever seen. And I'll never forget this until the day I die. I have been in the field for 23 years. I have never seen a certified Georgia death certificate that did not have a cause and manner of death. It's either self-inflicted, accidental, or murder. Nothing was checked off on Heather Turner's. To this day, it's still undetermined. Heather's death was tragic. And I think a lot of people were just left asking what happened that morning. And so we scheduled an interview with the person who could walk us through that. It is the Paulding County Coroner, Lindsay Eberhardt. But she pulled out at the last second. She sent us this official statement. It says, as the coroner, I responded to the death of Heather Turner. I filed my complete report and continue to stand by that report as it reflects the information I received and observed on scene. We have filed freedom of information requests for the police report, and we have been denied because the case is still open. So the only thing we have to go on in the meantime is Lindsay Eberhardt's coroner's report, and so I'm going to read it. Deceased name, Heather Turner. Weapon, a 38 caliber handgun. Note found, I'm sorry, I love you. Heather was found on her back in the floor, naked. Her hair was wet from her shower. She had an entrance wound. It appears to have been on the right side of her head, and there may have been a possible exit on the left side. No bullet was recovered. There was alcohol present on one of the nightstands in the bedroom, and a wall near the toilet had appeared to be washed. Mrs. Turner was transported to the GBI in Decatur on May 4th, 2017 for autopsy. And the update on this is that the case is ruled undetermined by the GBI medical examiner. I don't know what happened in that house on that morning. I'm hoping for answers. I am Cindy Clock, and I'm Heather's aunt. Heather was more of a daughter to me than she was a niece. When I found out that Heather died, I just dropped to my knees, and I just lost it. It's been five years now, and the case is not closed. When I ask a question, they say, no, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. This is an active and ongoing case. The coroner will not sit down and meet with us, and we are continuing to try and meet up with law enforcement to learn more about this situation. Thankfully, we do have people that really want to tell us everything they know, and that includes the people that really cared about Heather. Hi, Hi, Cindy. Hillary. It's so Come nice in. to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you Please for having in. me. For the person who has never met Heather, can you tell us a little bit about her personality? Who was she when she walked into a room? Well, first, she's just an amazing energy and light. She had a great sense of humor. She loved music. She loved to sing. She had a beautiful voice. She loved to try new things. She was a writer. She put it out there. She, at one point, she was writing songs. You had a very close bond with Heather. My sister struggled with some prescription drugs, and I was always there for Heather when her mother died in her sleep. That was very traumatic for Heather. Heather was how old when she got married? Right after high school. Philip was a local boy. He was raised in the church. His dad is a minister. Flash forward to here she is yeah. having a baby. Oh, man. <laughs> she was a great mom. They took the baby to church from day one, and they were just a really cute little family. And she began singing in the church. It feels like the postcard story. They're like the Canon Barbie of church. I know, and that's why you never see this coming. <laughs> Sir, take a deep breath. Listen, was this intentional? 
At the church at Cheatham Hill, we had our pastor, which was Terry Elsner, and then his son was Philip Elsner, and his wife, Heather, was over the youth group. Him and Heather really put in a lot of time with the kids. The kids looked up to them. It was a great atmosphere. And then Andy Turner had come on at the church as the associate pastor. He was a very charismatic guy. Andy made it seem like it was coming straight from his heart. Like he genuinely cared about your relationship with God. If he was talking about Noah and, and building the ark, you was in the boat with him. Me and Andy started getting closer and closer and he was this great guy, this big personality. He could go play in the mud hole, be a little bit of a country redneck, but at the same time you throw him in a suit and he could go eat a thousand dollar dinners with his pinky throat out. He brought this energy into the church. Even the teens would like to come in there and listen to Andy preach. You had Brother Terry and his wife, Philip and Heather, and Andy and Mindy, his wife. They just fit like a puzzle. It was a great church. Heather's a new mom. Mm -hmm. She's got her high school sweetheart husband. They're all involved in the church. It looks like a postcard. Mm -hmm. What is your first clue that something's wrong? Marriage is hard. I understood what it's like um, when you get married too young. Mm -hmm. I was talking to her about working it out with Philip or make things better, and she said she didn't want to, that she was in love with someone else. One day, I get a phone call from this lady that was a member of the church, all panicking. Oh my God, oh my God, have you heard what happened? Have you heard what happened? Andy, he got caught having an affair with Heather. And I said, no, no, you're crazy. So I just, I called him. And I'm like, Andy, what happened, man? He's like, man, I was counseling Heather and Philip. They was going through some stuff in their marriage. And I got sucked in. I said, Andy, you're a preacher. You're a man of God. You've told me how wrong this is. You know, it came out that they were having an affair, and it blew the church up. Philip was heartbroken when Heather left him. She ended up moving in our home. She brought her son. She said that she was in love with someone else. What did she tell you about him? Just said that he was a great guy, and she had a lot of fun with him, and they laughed a lot. These two letters are both from 2008. Dear Andy, I never want to lose you, honey. Never. When we get all of this behind us, we will be unbreakable. I love you with all of my heart, Heather. What was the first meeting between your family and Andy Turner? He came over to the house and I cooked dinner. He seemed nice and friendly, almost like he was trying to be over charming. They laughed a lot. But when I asked him questions, it was hard to get specific answers. After that first night, were you like, yes, Heather, I get it? And I was like, yes, I get your chemistry and your attraction, but I did not have the warm and fuzzies about this guy. They move in together. What is the setup? Do his kids start coming over? Mindy and Andy had joint custody. Was Heather's son living with them? In the beginning, yes. And then Heather became pregnant with Lexi. And do Heather and Andy get married? I did not know that they did. One day Heather came over to the house and she was wearing wedding rings. And I went, oh, Heather, oh my gosh, did you get married? And she goes, yeah, we got married. Did you feel weird that you weren't there as her family member? I did feel weird. Um, she just said the two of them eloped. I have a lot of my friends that said, man, you outpunted your coverage when you married Heather. But see, what they don't realize is that I chased her until she caught me. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? We didn't get to talk very often. And I would say, Heather, I want to see you. And she would say, I know, I miss you too, Aunt Sissy. I'll talk to Andy, but 
I kept seeing on Facebook these photos of the family and matching football shirts or, you know, some theme and travel and all that. And I was just thinking, well, maybe they do have a pretty good life. We're getting about five to six, sometimes some weeks a lot more, uh, just messages on our Facebook and emails and texts saying, how in the world do y'all have this happy marriage? Is it, is it real? <laughs> or is it you, you just married on Facebook? But we really do like each other. <laughs> no, we, we genuinely do. And I never dreamt that it could lead to, the, to this. Baby, okay, are you confessing your wife, Chad? I'm trying my best. Who is this? I am Andy's father. Is Andy okay? No. <laughs> okay, and you believe that she's beyond all help? Yes, ma'am. Is there anybody that can step outside that they can meet with responders? Yeah, I'll go out there. I get a phone call from Andy, and he goes, It's bad, Cindy. And I said, What? What is it? Is something happened to Heather? He goes, she's dead. She killed herself. And I said, Andy, where was Lexi? The kids, did they see it? And he said, Lexi was the only one here and she didn't see it. And I just lost it. I was like, don't apologize. And Heather was like losing a child. (laughs) Had Heather ever had mental health? Issues? Did she ever talk about suicide? No. Never, never, never. Heather was not a person that was depressed. She would not, it doesn't make sense. You build a bond when you're in a small community. They depend on you at the worst time of their life. This is very hard for me personally. I had a very good relationship with Andy Turner's mother and father. Curtis and Pam Turner were a role model in Paulding County. Curtis was a very powerful minister. Pam was working at Paulding County Probate Court. You know, dear friends of mine, their son's wife had committed suicide. So at the end of the arrangement conference, I said, Andy, I just saw her three days ago, man. I said, what happened? And he said, Heather's grandfather died about a month ago. She was losing her job and she's having custody issues with her former husband. And I'm, I'm waiting for some more why she committed suicide. I said, is that it? And he said, yes. We have left Paulding County because our next interview is with a funeral director who was a longtime family friend of the Turners. And he lived and worked in that community for years. But now, he no longer feels safe even stepping foot there. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Can you tell me a little bit about why you are staying anonymous on our show? With Heather's case, uh, there has not been an arrest made. Um, There's a lot of things up in the air, a lot of uncertainties. And my fear for retaliation for me talking, I have no idea. Just to be on the safe side, that's why I choose to be anonymous. How many suicides do you think you have dealt with in your career? Too many. Yeah. I could say a hundred or better. And so when Heather comes in, what are the things you're expecting to see being told it's a suicide? A hundred percent of suicides, an individual that has shot themselves, they have a burn around the entry of where the bullet went in. I call it muzzle blast when the bullet is ignited all that comes out and burns the individual's head Mm -hmm. heather did not have that when my associate he was embalming her and working on her head he said i want you to explain something to me and he you know he pointed out right off the get-go right up here was the entry wound was here i said where's the muzzle burn at if heather really did shot herself she would have had to from a distance used her thumb Entry here, exit here. So you'd have to get high enough, high enough. and far enough away to yeah, not have the muzzle burn. Yes. But to get that trajectory. Sure. Have you ever seen that in your career? Never. There's no way. Investigators are taking a second look at the death of a Paulding County mother. Her husband says it's suicide, but investigators are now calling the death questionable. 
tonight I spoke with the husband, Andy Turner. He says that he was not aware the investigation was being called questionable. Meanwhile, Paulding County investigators say they don't have a specific person of interest. They say at this point, everyone is being considered a person of interest. Even though there were a lot of serious questions about this case from the very beginning, the investigation seems to have stalled out. And so we've been working really hard to get law enforcement to talk to us about what the current status of Heather's case is. And we were finally able to get the Paulding County Sheriff's Office public information officer to agree to give us an on-camera statement. And then we got a text. This is Ashley. Hey, Sergeant. How are you? So I have some bad news. Our detectives have said that they want the GBI to respond to you guys instead of me. I'm sorry that it worked out this way. I thought that we had all our I's dotted and T's crossed, but uh, what I had figured out got overruled. So, Did they give a reason why um, they, they prefer to handle it? No, they didn't, and I, I really don't know. Are they worried at all about sort of jeopardizing the investigation, or are there active things happening right now? I mean, you guys are smart enough to know that there's obviously some concern about the way this situation occurred, and so it's not just an open and shut case. If it was, it would have been shut years ago. You know, the case has been open for five years. I'm wondering what other evidence you guys are still looking for. Well, not necessarily looking for, per se, but, you know, analyzing what was there and interviewing with uh, all the individuals trying to make a determination on what took place. All I can do is is what they'll allow me to do, uh, and I can only release what they'll allow me to release. All right. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye. So the GBI has gotten back to us right away. And we have an email from them saying, this particular case has been given to the DA's office. So what we have is the sheriff's department saying, no, we can no longer give you an on-camera statement because this is now in the hands of the GBI. We have the GBI saying, we've concluded our investigation and handed it off to the DA. In the meantime, Heather's friends and family have been living in limbo, and they deserve the answers that are in this investigation. I've been waiting a long time to talk about this. Heather was my best friend and the love of my life, and I know the truth about what happened to her, and it's been covered up, and it's time that the truth comes to light. In 2016, after years of being a stay-at-home mom, Heather got a job at the probate court, which is where her mother-in-law, Pam Turner, also worked. We're going to meet with Rob Aber. He was a co-worker of Heather's, and he should be able to give us a lot of information because she was confiding things in him during those last few weeks of her life. Rob? Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah. How are you? I'm, I'm doing. I'm all yeah. right. Oh, man. There's a lot to go through here. Yeah. In 2016, you're working in the probate office. Mm -hmm. At what point do you meet Heather Turner? Summer of 2016. That's when she first came to work in the office. We became really close, really good friends from the get-go. She was very sweet and kind, and she had a very giving personality. She was not closed off. We liked the same kind of movies, music. The only thing is, you know, she loved country music and I hate country music. <laughs> and I said, oh, you're listening to that trash? And she was just like, oh, shut up. And I said, well, you know what? If you love it, I'll listen to it. I would listen to country music all day if you like it. Is that <laughs> your way of flirting with her? Yeah, yeah. It was a flirtatious thing, yeah. You and Heather are buddies, but you clearly have a crush on her. I knew she was married, and I'm just not that kind of person. It was what it was. So what changed? There was one day in particular where she looked very down, and I, I noticed she just had this look on her face. I asked her, I said, Is, I mean, what's going on? Is everything okay? She's just like, I just, I just need to hold you. And I was just like, okay, okay. And I said, what's going on? And she was just crying. Um, but after that day, we started emailing each other. We would meet up in the jury deliberation room every day for lunch. But even at that point, it was just a flirtation. What did you know about her marriage? Did she, as your friend, confide in you 
about her home life? She would just be like, you have no idea, Rob. He's out of his mind. She started confiding in me and telling me that she wasn't married. And what? I said, what do you mean? She said, I've never taken vows with him. She said, he falsified the name of the minister who was going to marry them, and he turned it into probate court, and it got filed and legally binding document. And then it just, it kind of went into hyperspeed where we were talking about the future and just, we're going to be together. But then Andy got access to all of our emails. Heather told me, oh, all hell is broken loose in the office. Andy's over here. He's trying to get me fired. He's mad. He's accusing me of, you know, sleeping with you or sleeping with an attorney or he's telling me I'm doing all of this stuff. Did you receive a call from Andy? Yes. Mm -hmm. He said specifically that, um, oh, just to let you know, this whole thing with you and Heather is a lie. We're just doing this to screw with you. This is how we have our fun. We laugh our asses off at you about this because Heather's just toying with you and she's playing with you. This is not real. That's an explosive situation. I knew he was full of but I let him get to me. It got in your head. It did. I got to work that morning and I was fuming. Heather was crying and she was shaking and she was in a panic. And then I immediately sort of asked her, I said, is this all a game to you? And she just said, no, no. This is what he does. He's trying to make you hate me. This morning he was seven o'clock drinking tequila and he had a gun. I told her she needed to get a restraining order. She said a restraining order is not gonna do any good. He knows too many people. It's not gonna matter. It's not gonna keep him away from me. And I kept telling her, Heather, he's dangerous. You're not safe. Heather called me a couple of times and said, he's beating me, he's beating me, come get me. And before I could get there, she called me back crying. He says he's going to stop. Don't come, Aunt Sissy, don't come. If you come, you're just going to make it worse on me. One time, Heather's son was over at Heather and Andy's house with their children for the weekend. And when Heather brought the son back to her ex-husband, he took off his clothes to give him a bath and their bruises were all over his body. He immediately took him to the emergency room. The police got involved. Andy said that he played football with him. It got a little rough. And Heather ended up making an agreement that Heather's ex-husband would keep sole custody of the child so that he would be protected from Andy. Does that demonstrate how much she loved him or how he's brainwashed her? I don't know. What happens right after that? Do you continue making plans to leave together? Yeah. She was still very dedicated to getting out of there and moving things forward with us. That day started off like any normal day at work. But then we got called into the judge's office because our emails had been pulled. All of our dirty laundry, so to speak, was put out in the open. Judge was furious at us, told us, I'm going to expect that both of you are going to resign tomorrow. I told Heather, I love you. That's important to me. I, I don't care about this job. We can just quit. Let's just leave. Read this. Th this is May 3rd. She's dead May 4th. Mm -hmm. It's 12 hours earlier. Yeah. Can you tell me about this letter? Yes. Uh, this is the letter that Heather wrote me on May the 3rd. To briefly attempt a reply to your letter, I love you. I understand that you're afraid of being hurt, but please don't ever doubt how I feel about you. If I didn't see a future with you, I wouldn't waste your time. In you, I have found a love that I never knew existed. I dream constantly of where life could take us. Robbie, I honestly can't imagine life without you. Please always know... I love you wholeheartedly and have no reservations about us. And, um, you know, she gave that to me, and um, that's the last thing I have from her. Does that sound like the letter of a woman who's going to kill herself the next morning? No. She didn't take her own life. She wasn't depressed. She was looking forward to getting away from him. At this point, we have so many questions that can only be answered by Andy Turner. 
And so we have reached out to him in hopes of talking to him. But this morning, one of our producers gets a message from him. And so I'm going to call him. Hello, this is Andy. Hi, Andy. This is Hillary Burton Morgan. I, um, I'm grateful that you've been in touch with our producers. wanted to reach out and chat with you because I know that you're actually moving forward. So I wanted to make sure that I you know, had at least some dialogue with you to, to cover the right basis. Well, I would love to hear your side of it and be able to put that out there. You mentioned that you're aware that we're here. I knew when you walked out of the courthouse. Who told you uh, that? Well, my mom works at the courthouse. Okay. There was a couple of things that I need to cover. Heather was never leaving. Yeah. So that's the stuff that you don't have. All you have is just one-sided, she's leaving. Uh, and that, that's what makes it some ominous story, which is not true. We were, uh, we're a loving, happy family, and that's what I thought it was. She asked me to call Robbie because he was harassing her at work. So I called him and asked her, uh, you know, not, not to bother her anymore. It was a very cordial conversation. Is that what she told you, that she was being harassed? Yes, that's what she told me. Why do people in this town say that you killed Heather? Robbie and his family were just bitter. You know, he, he, he didn't like the, the idea that uh, she couldn't be in love with him. Do you feel frustrated but, that law enforcement has left you in limbo like this? Uh, I feel frustrated with the law enforcement in general. Uh, there, there's a lot of corruptness in, uh, in law enforcement, especially here. Uh, it feels like there's more of a vendetta. Uh, Against you? Uh, yeah. Christopher was a good man. He was the lead detective originally. When he walked out, it was open and closed case. Now it seems like because of social media, they don't want to close it. The coroner's report is still unresolved, and it does not check a box, whether it's suicide or homicide. And until that happens, people are going to continue to talk. So can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing to try to get that resolution? I'm not doing anything with Lindsay. Well, I wouldn't stick my nose in any of that. It's not, not my place. Did you, I'm sorry, did you say Lindsay? Yeah, Lindsay Ebbard. Okay, the right, right. I grew up with Lindsay. Oh, you know Lindsay? Yeah, I, I knew her father, you know, Jeff. Uh, they're, they're, they're good people. And I know she made some mistakes on this, but I wouldn't dare call her to even try to discuss it. Well, one of those things that people keep bringing up is the fact that the bullet was never recovered. Do you know what, what that's it, about? It definitely was. Yeah, it, it, it definitely was. It, it never ate. I mean, it seems like there's simple stuff that happens at every scene that should have been easy to figure yeah. out here. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too, too far into the weeds with you. I'm just trying to help you understand the overall. So when you paint the picture, that you, you understand that you don't have the facts, you know, or at least all of them. You, you have slivers of truth that has been distorted. The abuse that Heather reported to friends and loved ones, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, see, so all of that I'm extremely disappointed to read. And, and, and I, I, I still say that I, I, I don't believe that comes from her. I think that's them making stuff up. She definitely, like, wrote about it in emails. Did you read those emails? I saw some emails. I don't believe those come from her. There are photos of uh, her son's battered body. And so if you could walk me through that. Yeah, I, I don't. All, all of that was handled way back then, and uh, she even handled that and was part of that. I don't want to. I don't want to address that one. Are there records that we can take a look at just on our end to make sure we're not portraying anything inaccurately? Yeah, I mean, she she, she went and, and talked to them, and they they closed it. Nothing ever happened because she wouldn't tell them what happened that day. I thought the court took her son out of your home and wouldn't let him no, come back. No, that is 100% inaccurate. That that never happened. The court was never involved, uh, never took him out. Um, 
I mean, there's a there's a court there's there's documents, Andy, that it went through the court. But I see when when people tell you stuff that that's false, it, it it's bad. It's been extremely heartbreaking. Nobody understands what it looks like from our eyes. If this was resolved and it was finally, you know, if the sheriff's department, if the coroner finally checked a box, that this would resolve itself for you. The the truth and the facts are there. Uh, and then there, there's people making up stories that's quite hurtful. And I'm getting death threats. My kids have been harassed at school, and I've been slandered and defamed bad. People on Facebook want to make up stories. I, I don't know who, who's friend to throw. Our family is writing a book and a movie about what we've gone through, we experienced from our side. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be careful with what I say. Well, look, if you could reach out to your lawyers and let them know this production would love to have some on-camera time with you. I'll, uh, I'll reach out to them, but I, I, I wanted you to have at least a heart knowledge of where we're coming from. Great. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Right. <sighs> if I were him and the whole town thought I was a murderer, I would be on the police's ass. Like, disclose this information, show the autopsy, close the case, call it a suicide so that my kids can leave the house. Andy's story as to why Heather's case is still open and has not been declared a suicide is that there's a conspiracy against him. But meanwhile, you have all these members of the community who firmly believe her death was not a suicide and they point to Andy's own actions right after Heather's death as further proof of their suspicions. A nanny's allegations against a former youth pastor. Meantime, police are investigating his wife's death. I was lonely, and uh, she was there. Within a couple weeks after Heather's death, Andy started dating Christy Chubb, Heather and Andy's nanny. She lived in the home with Andy, kind of raised the kids, dressed matching outfits with Lexi and started their new family. And it wasn't long until Andy began abusing her as well. I am setting a compliance hearing. A Paulding County judge has now granted Chup a permanent restraining order against Turner. He choked me and was choking me really hard and said that he could kill me right now. He was putting these children who still haven't healed through new relationships and all of that chaos right after Heather had died. He had me laying on my stomach one time, and he told me I should hold Heather's ashes. That way he could be having sex with both of us. We asked him about that allegation specifically. He told you that? Yes. Are you serious? Yes. Wow. All right. In court, listening to the proceedings were the deputies investigating the death of Heather Turner, the former youth pastor's wife. Why the district attorney at that time, which was Dick Donovan, did not investigate this i cannot answer that question but this is holden county georgia everybody knows everybody your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system we have gotten more information from the gbi they have now informed us that they turned over their investigation in december of 2019 so the polling county da has had it for years at the tone, please record your message. Now, the DA who was in charge at that time, Dick Donovan, was subsequently charged with unprofessional conduct and dismissed. And the new DA was only recently officially appointed by the governor in March of 2022. Hi, Mr. Rollins. Uh, my name is Hillary Burton Morgan, and I am in town with a production from Sundance. We are covering the Heather Turner case, and I would so appreciate any help on your end. If this was a suicide, it would be so easy to open up that file, see the GBI's determination and say, guys, case closed, it's a suicide. The fact that they haven't done that makes me question what is in that investigation. I want the truth. If it's a suicide, call it a suicide. Close a case. Let's all get on with our lives and start maybe healing our hearts, but they can't call it a suicide because it was not. Is there anybody else in the residence with you? Is it just you? No, I got my baby daughter here. 
in the 911 call, he talks about Lexi being asleep and nobody knows what's going on except for him. Angie, where is your daughter? Is she, is she asleep? She's asleep on the couch in the living room. To, on the news, Lexi walked in right after it all happened. She seen her mother laying there. My daughter and I heard a noise and ran to the door, and that's, uh, that's what we found. It, the stories don't match. And then there's this, nearly 12 minutes into the 911 call. Andy, this is mother. Turner says two minutes before he dialed 911, he called his parents who lived 10 minutes away. Andy called his parents before he called 911. That doesn't make sense. If I came home and found my wife in that condition, the first thing I would do, call 911. The coroner's report says Turner was found naked, her hair still wet. Your shower off. You're turning your shower off? I have to hear you. I question the entire shower scenario. Why even take a shower if you know what your intent is? I'm going to write, I love, I'm sorry I love you, and then shower and then commit suicide, or wait, did I shower and then write the note? Like, this doesn't work. Blasty shot herself in the bathroom. Your wife, where did she shoot herself? In the head. If someone's going to shoot suicide, normally they're going to put the gun up to their temple. Heather's case, the entry wound was up here. There's no way to get your finger in a trigger inside and turn that muzzle. It, it would be impossible. Also, where's the bullet, buddy? Where's the bullet? No bullet was recovered. Also, it noted that there was alcohol present on one of the nightstands in the bedroom, and a wall near the toilet had appeared to be washed. The crime scene was not processed properly. Things got cleaned. Like, if it's suicide, don't touch a thing. Get them in here. Let's prove this. It's in everyone's best interest. Okay. We have heard back from the DA, and I'm even more confused. He said it's not true that law enforcement has concluded their investigation. He says that the case is still open, and that he's just there to support investigators' efforts. And so we're right back at square one. Everyone tells us to go talk to somebody else. I'm very concerned that this will be shelved until we die and then they'll close the case when there's no more Team Heather. Everyone surrounding this case says that they want answers. Heather's family, members of the community, Andy Turner says that he can't live a normal life with this hanging over his head and the fact that all these years later it's just sitting there. It is a disservice to this community it's a disservice to Heather's loved ones, and it's a disservice to Heather.